Well, thank you every much, everyone for joining us today for leadership communication in the virtual world, executive presence, and your professional brand. My name is Greg Owen Boger. I am the EVP of Learning and Business Development here at Turpin Communication. And co-facilitating with me today is Dale Ludwig, our president and founder. Hello. And we also have Kevin Vogelsang, our director of operations, and he will be the host today, taking good care of us. Say hi, Kevin. And he is going to be going off video because as the host, he's going to be quite busy in the background, making sure that we all have a favorable video and audio experience. So if we draw our eyes to the title of today's webinar, Leadership Communication in the Virtual World, the three of us were talking earlier in the week and we were like, you know what? We've all been virtual for going on four months now. Maybe we have something unique to say. So we thought, well, let's get rid of the word virtual and let's put in hybrid. And then we're doing so much more than just hybrid work as well right now, right? So then we said, let's change the webinar title to leadership communication in the modern world. And modern will just take care of all of the variables that we've been dealing with the last few months, few, few years. Now, we have lots of people in today's webinar that already know us and the work that we do. But for those of you who are new to Turpin Communication, we thought it would be important to give you a little bit of context for why we are delivering this content. So we've been working with leaders and emerging leaders over the years to help them be more effective and efficient in their communications. And we do that by working with presenters, meeting facilitators, and trainers. And over the years, Dale and I have co-authored a handful of books and contributed to several. The one on the left, The Orderly Conversation, is one of them that we will talk a little bit about today because it is the, the foundation of all of the work that we do here at Turpin Communication. So today, we are going to bring together three meaty topics, business communication, professional branding, and executive presence. I'm going to pull those three things together and, and just uh, call them leadership communication. That's the big bucket we're going to put all of those in. So a little bit of housekeeping. I've already said this a few times, but please, if you are able to turn your camera on, we sure would appreciate it because as we've, you may have also heard me say, using the camera is a skill that we all need to learn. There is a uh, an art and a science to it, and we're going to share with you some of that. So you might as well turn your camera on and start practicing as we uh, as we work through that. Selfishly, it's more fun for us if we if we can talk to people whose faces we can actually see. So right now, I'm looking at Matt and Tamar and Kelly and Poonam and Megan and Isabel. Thank you for turning your camera on. Much appreciated. And I can see that you're smiling, you're nodding. It makes me feel good. And that's one of the things that's really important to let people know that you are actually engaged in the conversation that's taking place. That said, there are legitimate reasons for being uh, off the video, and we honor that. We would ask you, though, to eliminate distractions, turn off the phone, turn off the email. That way you can be in this meeting with us today, because we want you to ask questions and comment as things bubble up for you. You can do that through taking yourself off mute and just asking a question. You can also drop a comment or a question into chat. Now, I have the chat pod moved over here to my second monitor alongside all of your videos. If I happen to miss it or Dale happens to miss it, Kevin will let us know that someone has something to say and we will address it in, in real time. So our agenda, we're going to talk through guiding principles of leadership communication. Then we will dive into executive presence. What is it and what does it mean for me? And then we will get some boots on the ground, leadership communication tools and techniques so that you can be intentional with how you begin to build your brand of executive presence. So let's start with principles of leadership communication. Dale, I'm going to turn things over to you so you can walk us through those. Okay. I want to talk a little bit about pretty, as Craig said, fundamental stuff here. I think that whenever we're talking about leadership communication or any of the any of the other types of work that we do, we always wanna make sure we're working from a good foundation. So for this, on this slide, as you can see, we've got a triangle with three bullet points on it. At the bottom, people need urgency, frequency, and clarity from leadership. I would say they need it from everybody in an organization, but as you move up in an organization, it becomes more and more important. You have to think about what people need to hear from you what the situation requires and also what the organization needs. So it's as if your, your 
way you look at things becomes broader and broader, you know, depending on your position within the organization. Now, interestingly, oh, back G, before the pandemic, I think, when we started putting this, this webinar together, we started looking at all the different ways that you can look at leadership communication, what are its components, and you can come up with things like emotional intelligence, having a pretty strong presence there, executive presence, which is related to leadership, but not exactly the same thing. There's professional branding that people want to talk about. There are soft skills, which there's a lot of argument about. Do you want to call them soft skills or do you want to call them human skills or, or power skills? I prefer something other than soft skills because they are so fundamental to the work that, that everyone does. So our goal here is to help all of us, help all of you cut through all of this information and make it meaningful for you, which means we need to find connections, we need to find the overlaps, and we need to figure out how to direct someone's improvement as they work on their leadership communication. Now, this is a photo of me in a classroom, and it's this is our tagline, business communication untangled. And we're using this slide because we're sort of used to, to cleaning up others' messes. I hope that doesn't sound very good, does it? But it's true. Many people come to us with their heads just in a tangle about what they should do to communicate better. And a lot of that has to do with what they were taught in school. A lot of it has to do with bad advice they've received, sometimes from managers, or especially if it's a manager that says, why don't you you know, be more like me. And of course, that's, that's not going to work. But our job is to look at how people are coming across, give them very simple ways to improve, and give them permission to ignore things that do not work for them, which is why we talk about the untangling part. So for you, what's needed and why? When you are developing your skills, there are really three steps. Now, they don't march along in, in this order all of the time, but you have to start with awareness. What are the skills required? or a given situation, then you need to assess in the middle there how you're using those skills and then developing the skills that you need to, to develop. I mean, obviously, once you assess yourself, you're going to find out, oh, well, there are some things that I'm doing very well, so I don't need to worry about those, but there are other things that I need to, other behaviors that I need to change, and that's about developing your skills, which always involves breaking habits, which is why development is always the toughest thing to do, because you're comfortable with the communication skills that you have and being asked to change those at this point in your career is often really difficult. But once we realize that what we're looking at here is simply knowing what needs to happen, defining things the way they need to be defined, taking a real serious look at how well individuals are doing, how well they are coming across using their communication skills, then we will know what to develop. So it's all about narrowing and simplifying as you move across left to right on the screen. And of course, it requires a huge amount of self-awareness. The, the executive presence stuff that we're going to talk about in a bit is all about developing your self-awareness so that you will know how to respond to people, know what, how you're coming across to other people. But anytime we're talking about improving a soft skill, we're talking about being really aware of what you're doing. So one way to look at this is to think about the type of communication that occurs in the workplace. We can put it on, a, can put all, all sorts of things on a continuum between informal and formal. So as you can see with informal, we have just casual conversations and chance encounters, you know, just chatting with people on the way to your office or whatever. And then on the other side, we have very formal situations, which are speeches, or the best example in today's world is the TED Talk, which, and both of these are not only formal, but they're very controlled, they're rehearsed, they're scripted, there's not a lot of room with those sorts of uh, speeches for variation, there's no ad-libbing. So you have one on the left, lots of ad-libbing, that's what it's all about, two, there's no room for it at all on the other side. Now in the middle, we have what we interpret communication call orderly conversations. And as you can see, all of these situations, meetings, virtual meetings, face-to-face -face meetings, one-on-ones, all of these situations are have characteristics of both the formal, formal setting speeches and the informal in that they are both structured, but they are all both spontaneous. So if you want to get business done, 
you got to get used to using this type of communication. Their plan structure should be responsive and interactive. And as you can see here, this is by far the biggest bucket because it incorporates almost everything that we do in any kind of structured way when we're communicating at work. So when we talk about the orderly conversation, I want to focus on the arrow between these two circles because there is a big tension occurring here when you're communicating in this way. On one side, as you can see, it's orderly. So there needs to be some preparation. The accuracy is important. There needs to be some structure that is not only present in the conversation, but communicated, emphasized as the conversation goes forward. And then on the other side, you have the conversation itself, which requires a lot a high level of engagement between you and the people you're talking to. They're spontaneous, they're interactive. So obviously the arrow indicates the fact that these two circles, the information in these two circles don't always play well together because you're, you, the question of how much do I prepare? How much do I let this conversation go? All of those things are part of this image and this, this process. So the thing you need to remember is that when you're preparing for a presentation or a meeting or any, any sort of important conversation, you're always looking ahead to the uncertainties of that conversation. And then when it starts, you're always adapting the, what was planned to what's happening in the moment. So that's where engagement comes in. You need to be aware of how people are responding. You need to be aware of what they're saying, what, what they seem to be feeling in order to manage that conversation. So that's where our work rests. That's what we think about a lot, trying to help people get more comfortable with a pretty complex type of communication. So these types, this business communicators, orderly conversation people succeed on two different levels. And it's important to understand what the two are so that you can understand how they influence each other. On the, on the left, let's look at the plan. Let's say you're having, you're facilitating a meeting. You want to achieve the goal of the meeting, meaning that you want the people sitting across the table from you or, or virtually to buy, agree, align, learn. All of those are very practical business goals. In order to reach those goals, though, you need to think about managing the process. That means that, as you can see there, create the conditions for a fruitful discussion, earn trust and goodwill, make it easy for folks, nurture relationships, and manage the give and take. So this goes back to being ready to adapt the plan during an orderly conversation because you've got to get people talking, but at the same time, you have to reach the goal over on the left side of the slide. So that's, when you think about these, what these things mean and how they're achieved on the right, some of these are pretty broad, create the conditions for a fruitful discussion, which is a fairly general statement about the fact that you need to think about bringing people in to the conversation with you and making them happy to be there. And sometimes, as you can see in the middle there, it's just simply about making, making it easy. This goes to slide design. This goes to how well you explain something, how concise you are. All of these things, of course, have lead you to achieving the first level of success. So it's good to be able to separate these things out and say, okay, if I'm not doing as well as I want, where am I going wrong? It's probably on the managing the conversation side. And from there, you can start picking things apart and realizing what, what needs to be improved. I mentioned emotional intelligence on one of the first slides that I was talking about. And if, you're, if you are familiar with emotional intelligence, you'll know that there's a lot of overlap between what I'm talking about and, and the concepts, the four abilities as they're called in emotional intelligence. On the left, self-awareness and self-management. In other words, being going back to self-awareness again and then changing your behavior in re response to what you are aware of, and also social awareness and relationship management, meaning that you're aware of other people, you're aware of their emotions. You are using those emotions not in a manipulative way, but you want to manage a relationship without ignoring how people are feeling, and you need to you trust yourself to manage those emotional aspects, I suppose you could say, of the, of the conversations that you're having. Greg, do you want to talk about relationship management a bit? I do, because relationship management is something that probably we never thought about prior to uh, the last four years or so. And we took it for granted because 
you know, relationship management in traditional meetings, it just happened, right? We sat in a room with one another and through the process of a meeting or a conversation, the relationship started to develop and it nurtures over time. Then we went virtual and things got much more complicated in the world of nurturing relationships. Even, I mean, so much so that we, many of us had those five o'clock happy hours every week that seemed to be if not mandatory, encouraged. And that didn't last very long because those were miserable. The last thing any of us wanted was to spend more time more in time. Zoom, Let's get even Zoom if there again. was a cocktail in our hands, right? And so, but we, but we still felt that need to have relationships and move them forward. And then things got even more complicated when we started working in hybrid environments. Well, why is that? Because they feel like this more likely than looking like this, right? People are not always happy uh, in a in a hybrid meeting. We can see here with this uh, group, they're distracted. No one is focused. The people online clearly are experiencing something not fun. And Lena has decided she is simply not going to be on video. So we need to think about what are some of the situational dynamics that we have to take into consideration as leaders when we are working in a hybrid environment. And the first thing to think about is that videos can pull people to focus. So think back to the good old days when we used to sit in a conference room on the conference phone. Remember when, us, when someone who was dialed in from elsewhere was speaking, we would look at the phone, which is silly because we should have been looking at everyone, right? But the same thing is true in a hybrid environment. For some reason, when we are sitting in the main room, the videos pull focus, which means we might unintentionally ignore people who are in the room with us. Now, another draw is decision makers, that there's a gravitational pull that, that um, if there's a decision to be made, we might spend more focus on that person. And we want to be careful that we're not ignoring other people. Now, if we put ourselves in this very complicated hybrid meeting, you can see we've got a group in the conference room here where we, the viewers, are sitting. We've got another group here in the middle of the screen. We have a bunch of other people dialed in virtually, and Lena has decided that she still is not going to be on video. So she's very easy to forget, right? We have to be careful about that because maybe Lena has something really wonderful to say, and we need to make space for her to say that. The other complication, I don't know if you've figured this out or, or noticed this before, but there's no visible nameplate. Now, I have to tell you, I did not have any idea how comfortable I had become just knowing that someone's name was right there on their video. Uh, Megan, I'm looking at you right now. We've never met, but Megan, I can I know your name, right? But if we once we're in a hybrid environment, all of a sudden we lose the nameplate. And it's really complicated because well, we our team was in a hybrid meeting, many hybrid meetings. This particular one in in uh, that I want to talk about was I had there were four people in a client's conference room. The Dale and I were both virtual, and the camera in that room was so far away from where they were sitting that even though I had met two of those individuals before, I couldn't see their faces. I had no idea who was who, who was sitting where, and when someone would speak. I had no idea who it was. So finally, I just, I called that out, that that's the problem I'm having right now. So I asked them just to go around the room and tell me who's sitting where, and then I mapped that out on a piece of paper. So that might be something that, that you want to think about in, because it's important to use people's name and be inclusive. And that brings me to this notion of proximity bias. You may have heard this in the past if you took any sort of management training, but let me just read the slide and define what proximity bias is, and then we'll talk about it. So proximity bias is the idea that employees with close physical proximity to their team and company leaders will be perceived as better workers and ultimately find more success in the workplace than their remote counterparts. We go on to say, that bias often looks like on-site employees having access to better perks and getting more time with executives, while remote employees may get left out of the meetings, inadvertently silenced on calls, and potentially even paid less than their co-located peers. So let's go back and think about Lena. It's very likely that she is experiencing proximity bias. So we have to be really, really careful about being intentional about being inclusive with our meetings. The thing that we have discovered works the best for us is to establish what we call advocates. 
So an advocate is someone that you assign early on in the meeting uh, to be the person who can monitor chat. In this particular case, Kevin, our host, is monitoring chat. So we can call him your advocate. If you're if you have people in conference room, you can give someone their permission to interrupt and monitor and speak for the room. Because if you are if you are leading the meeting virtually, you may have no idea that something is actually happening in that room. So you need the advocate to to be your eyes, ears, and voice in that room. Of course, you want to uh, communicate those expectations in advance so that your advocates are fully aware that they have a role to play, but also that everybody else can recognize that they have an advocate to, to help them participate fully. Now, if you want to read up about how we, uh, our, our other thoughts about hybrid, Kevin is going to drop a link into chat at the end of today's webinar, specifically around hybrid communication. And that, my friends, brings us to executive presence. What is it and what does it mean for me? Let me ask you this question. How would you like to be described by the people you work with and for? Don't put anything in the chat just yet. Think about that. Kevin is going to drop in a list of how I want to be perceived. My attributes are genuine, honest, likable, articulate, trustworthy, someone people want to work with, approachable, and a problem solver. So you can see where we're, the sort of thing we're going for. Now drop into chat how you want to be perceived. You can steal from my list. You can add to it. You can have as many attributes as seems appropriate for you. Trustworthy, competent, authentic, accessible, relevant, responsible, valuable, polished, a thought partner, someone who adds value, insightful, loving, charismatic, and fun, uh, welcoming, friendly, thoughtful, smart, competent, articulate, trustworthy, trust all great attributes. Christine adds honest, trustworthy, welcoming, understanding, trusted, excellent. So, why are we asking this question? Well, it's simple. You started to define your professional brand because how can you be intentional about how you show up for other people if you don't actually know how you want to show up? So you've started to identify your unique professional brand, which is very deeply connected to why we're all here today, which is executive presence. Now, if I were to ask you, how would you define executive presence? you probably would struggle quite a bit. You might say someone who can own a room. Well, what exactly does that mean? Someone who has gravitas. Uh, yeah, uh, that's if I get at it. Uh, someone who is an excellent communicator. Yeah, but that isn't really it either. And see, this is the problem that we faced for many years when our clients would come to us and say, hey, Got this guy, he's about to move into the C-suite, but he's rough around the edges. Can you help him with his executive presence? Or we've got a group of young professionals who are in an, an emerging leaders program, and they don't really know what executive presence is. Can you teach that to them? And the answer was always, we're not sure, because if we can't define executive presence, how can we actually coach it? So I went on a journey and I read a bunch of stuff and I was disappointed at every step of the way until I landed on this book right here, All the Leader You Can Be, The Science of Achieving Extraordinary Executive Presence. Now, one of the things that bugged me about all the other stuff I read was that it was all written by old white guys. I recognize I'm an aging white guy, but I can name the fact that not everybody is old and white, and we don't care how you became a leader. What's important is how can other people do it, given their unique brand. So Suzanne Bates, a, a woman, wrote this book, and that got me really, really excited. And we're going to talk more about that excitement as we move forward. But I want to give you Suzanne's definition. She says, the qualities of a leader that engage, inspire, align, and move people to act. She goes on to say, by understanding how your intentions as a leader match up with other people's perceptions, you can learn how to flex your style to gain trust, build alignment, and lead change. It's not about owning a room, not about gravitas, not about physical appearance. It's about how do people react to you and are you able to lead change? So executive presence 
using this definition, which I love, is based on other people's perceptions of you. So building your self-awareness is the only way that you can improve those perceptions. You have to know, first of all, how people are perceiving you so that you can make alterations in your behaviors and your, your communication to improve those outcomes. Now, one of the things you might be thinking right now is why are people who are authors themselves talking about somebody else's book? Well, it's a legitimate question. And you know, when I read the book the first time, first couple of times, I got so excited because their work and ours dovetailed very, very nicely because we now have a definition of what executive presence is and we can now coach it. So we became certified in the Bates EXPI uh, program. So here we have the 15 facets that Suzanne and her colleagues through years of research have come up with that all leaders possess. Now we all have these, these 15 facets in different combinations and different of, different of those facets shine in different ways for us. But unless we're anyone is a narcissist, you have all 15 of these characteristics. And the neat thing is, is that they show up in meetings. So it's uh, observable behaviors that can be coached. Now, I'm going to turn things over to Dale here in just a moment, but I do want to explain why Suzanne Bates uses the term facets. I think this is really interesting because if you look here at this screen, there are lots of jewels that have been carved and polished in different ways. And each one of us is carved and polished in different ways as well. And we show up differently depending on the light that we're in or the situation that we find ourselves in. So that explains why... Uh, Jesse, my eyes just landed on you. This explains why your brand of executive presence is very different from mine. And yet we can both be described as having executive presence. We just show up differently. And that makes makes uh, it makes it possible to coach people in a way that meets their unique brand rather than making cookie cutters out of all of us. Now we're going to take a deep dive into some of these facets. Before we do that, though, I want to let you know that at the end of the webinar and in an email later today, you're going to get a copy of this handout. It's very robust. So if you're a note taker, you may not need to take quite so many notes because it's going to be all located here in this handout. So Dale, I'm going to turn things over to you. OK, we've seen this slide before. But I want to kick off this discussion of the, the facets by reinforcing again that we're talking about always considering what's needed from you, from the individuals you're working with, all the way up to the organization, and the urgency, frequency, and clarity that is, that is required. So it's all about how can you meet the needs of the people that you are working with. So here's a slide of all of the facets again, the ones circled are the ones that I'm gonna be talking about in a little more detail. And I'm going to admit right off the bat that the first exposure I had to Suzanne Bates, I saw this image and I thought, oh, there's so much there. I can't, this is gonna be really hard. I'm not, I'm gonna fail. It's, that was the assumption that I was making that I, I was gonna turn out to have, you know, zero ability in one of these areas. and. Fortunately, I was wrong because they, the more you get to know how this, how her system works and how this chart should be used, the simpler it becomes. And I think that she's done a really nice job of separating out, making it easier to talk about things in, from, a, from various directions. So let's dive into the first dimension here, which is character. Let's define the dimension first, those three, those three columns that march across the top of the table. These are qualities fundamental to a leader as a person, their identity, give us a reason to trust them. So in other words, these are things you, as she put it in the book, these are things you learn as a kid. This is how you're brought up. Fundamentals of who you are that build trust and goodwill, they're developed early in life, make other people wanna work with you. All of those things are part of character. So if we look at the, a few of these more specifically, Authenticity is at the top of the list here. It's about being real, genuine, and transparent and sincere in your relations and interactions with others. So I doubt any of us would think that we are not authentic. So, okay, good. We know that this one is one that we all, we all possess. So then the question is, how does it show up at meetings? What does it look like to be authentic in a meeting? This is really a much narrower look at it than, than the, the general way of 
for feeling someone's authenticity. So diving in here, communicating unambiguously and from the heart. She brings in emotion, just like emotional intelligence shows up here. Telling compelling stories to reveal who you are. That would push me a bit beyond my comfort zone to tell a lot of stories about myself. Nevertheless, doing so can make me seem more authentic if I am the leader in the room. Connecting with people, especially through eye contact, communicating how you really feel, expressing empathy and vulnerability, admitting when you don't know the answer. So the bottom two there are very, are very similar in that you don't have to be perfect. Let people know how you're thinking. Let people know how you feel. Let them know you a little bit more. I think that telling stories about, about yourself is important. It, the higher up you go, the, the bigger distance between you and the people that you're leading, just in terms of organizational structure, they still want to know you as an individual. They want to know you as a person. And so I think being able to tell stories about your background, your development, whatever it happens to be about, really helps them connect with you and understand what you are genuinely like. So authenticity has a few practical applications here in, in business meetings, like the you know, eye contact being mentioned, communicating how you feel as part of the process. All of those things are, are important in the business environment. Let's go on to concern. Demonstrating interest in others, promoting a healthy, sustainable culture. So it's demonstrating interest in others so that you can have a healthy, sustainable culture. So you gotta care about the people you're working with. What does it look like in meetings? Create the conditions for a fruitful discussion to take place. This I mentioned before on the two levels of success slide. Listening well, seeking to understand, asking what others think, empathizing with others, so you care for others. Those three are all related. You can ask what, you, what others think and then ignore it, but that's probably not gonna make you look like you're too concerned about them. Speaking sincerely and with positive intent and then finding nurturing relationships through effective communication. So unlike authenticity, this is about how you're treating, treating the other people in the room. Do you appear to be genuinely interested in their perspective? And when things get hectic, when when we're going nuts with some problem at work, it's really hard to express empathy for the people that you're working with if, you're, if you disagree with them or if you're frustrated with them or any of those things that naturally happen. Concern is something that you can't give up if you wanna come across as a really effective leader. Do you have any questions or thoughts about any of these dimensions? I didn't talk about several of them, so if you have any questions, let me know. Dale, may I ask a question? Sure. You're looking at, you know, one of the pieces that um, is is that situational awareness. So mm -hmm. how much emotion is appropriate for the situation and the, uh, you know, the showing that you care uh, while also looking, you know, having that composure. Do you think that, the Suzanne Bates book is a good resource on those types of things. Would you look for a coach? What would be your suggestion for someone that knows they're so authentic that sometimes it's overwhelming to others? <laughs> yeah, you're getting to the over strengths that, um, that Bates talks about. Greg's going to mention those a bit, a bit later on. But you can have too much of any one of these things. And if you're too authentic, Oh, I can't remember, Greg, how does she describe the too authentic person? It's like an oversharer. Is that, is that what it was? That's one and of it, the things for sure. Uh, and, and the handout that we're going to give you actually does list what, about how does a, uh, an overstrength show up in each one of these facets. But I do think, you know, she, Suzanne talks about understanding how are you coming across and then leaning in or pulling back on any of these facets to improve the outcome, not only in the short term, but also the long term, right? Because your your leadership community or your executive presence builds up over time. And she also talks about everything is situational, which means we have to be able to be self-aware. It goes back to emotional intelligence, right? Like what does this situation need right now? Another thing that I, it's been on my mind recently because I'm trying to write a, an article about a in response to an HBR article, which I thought was really good because it was about listening, 
was about actively listening and being a better, better listener. And one of the new ideas in it was that there are four defaults people have in terms of listening. And one of them has to do with relationships. So that person listens only to, to in, through the lens of that person's relationship to the speaker and that they are listening to. And they tend to miss other things like analytical thinking or, or you know, clear direction about where things are going. They're really focused on the relationship. And I think an overstrength of authenticity related to that is, is very similar. And I think it, it always goes back to self-awareness. Okay, I know I tend to do this, so I need to find a way to, to adapt away from that a bit. Am I answering your question, Kelly? Or did I wander? Okay, <laughs> thank you. Anybody else? Hey, Dale, I was just wondering if um, why you chose the two and, and across the 15, you identified seven. Why, why, why those and not the others in, in terms of this presentation? <clears throat> Gee, we did it so long ago. I think we tried to get a nice mixture of how do you how do you think about yourself and how do you think about others, but also the most fundamental ones back at the beginning of the pandemic. We've added a couple on the style side, or at least one on the style dimension. I know, but authenticity and concern has been the real has been the, the focus for a long time here. And I think with authenticity, you also get at humility and you get at a bit of restraint to not react so emotionally to a situation that you lose people's, uh, the, your, your ability to lead effectively. Greg, do you wanna respond to that? I think you, I think you did. I do wanna say something though about integrity. Mm. I had a manager, we're talking about 30 years ago, before Turpin was as successful as it is, I, I balanced the work between Turpin and another consulting firm. It was a leadership development firm the worst managers I've ever had in my life, believe it or not, worked for this organization, but that's another story for another time. But one of the one of the individuals at this organization, if you were to have asked him, he would say that he absolutely has integrity. Now, if we unpack his behaviors, though, we can see that his the perceptions of that were not in alignment because he would overpromise to people. And then because he did that all the time in meetings, he didn't deliver against what he promised. He meant it in the moment, but he actually didn't do the work, right? He yeah, would show up late because he <laughs> overpromised in the previous meeting. And he would <laughs> not... Can we, tur uh, Kevin, mute that person? Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah. He, would, he would show up ill-prepared to meetings because he didn't have enough time to do the work, right? And so people would describe him as not having integrity. So there's a disconnect. And that's why growing our self-awareness around these facets, Correct. I think, is so important mm -hmm. yeah integrity is really an interesting one because not being on time affects the impression of integrity that you're making and which is really interesting because it comes down to really basic stuff like have some respect for these folks have some and and do do the most fundamental things that you need to do to to earn their trust but i'm going to go on to the next dimension let's look at substance Substance, let me move my video. I only have one monitor going here. Cultivates qualities of mature leadership that inspire commitment, inform action, and lead to above and beyond effort. So that's a pretty lofty definition of these things. Situational behaviors and attitudes that build credibility and respect. Visionary, able to communicate a bit of the picture of the future. Mature qualities of leadership that accrue over time. So unlike the first dimension, this one is about things that you've, you've learned in the workforce. You've learned doing your job. So practical wisdom, confidence, composure, resonance, and vision all have to do with how mature you are within the organization that you work. So we're going to talk about resonance first. And this is a pretty specific definition. It's connecting with others, attentive, attuned, responsive to feelings, motivation, and thoughts deepening alignment. So it's about how well you communicate with others and how hard you work to make sure they understand what you are what you're saying to them. So breaking it down into meeting behaviors, being concise, 
simplifying the, simplifying the message to give others exactly the amount of information they need. Harder said than done. Using language the group understands in order to not intimidate, confuse, or make people feel bad. Think about somebody new in an organization and they haven't quite learned all the jargon and they're sitting in a meeting having no idea what people are actually talking about. That's a lack of resonance. So the people communicating there need to take into account that that person isn't exactly up to speed on everything, that the shortcuts that everybody makes communicating. Listening well, expressing empathy, empathy again, creating an open environment and inviting dialogue, telling stories to make concepts real to people and the business, being self-aware and aware of others. So this one really falls pretty clearly into the terrific communication wheelhouse because it has to do with how well people are receiving your message, not simply on how clearly you think you communicated it. And there's a big, there's a big dis distinction there because you have to accept things that are difficult to accept. You have to not be too frustrated when people aren't quite getting your point and taking responsibility for that. So resonance is, has become one of the, one of the most interesting of these for me because it relates so closely to, to our work. That's a good vision. Generating, generating, sorry, an inspiring enterprise-wide picture of what could be, which sounds like a really good CEO or something. Recognizing emerging trends and engaging all in strategy. So what it looks like, telling stories again to paint a picture of what could be. Being thorough without going into too much detail. Communicating the what and the why. Being optimistic, inspiring others. So this is about how well you talk about the business, talk about the work to be done, whether or not people are understanding what you're saying. For the middle bullet there, communicating the what and the why, it's about opening up a little bit to explain how you think about something, explain how the decision was made, as well as what the decision was. Because it's when we are training uh, a lot of trainers, a lot of uh, subject matter experts that we work with are engineers. And for them, we often say, you know, and they're training non-engineers. So we always say, you know, it would really be helpful for your people you're training to understand how you think as an engineer. Give them big picture look at how you look at the world through your engineering eyes, and they will understand better and more deeply what, what you're telling them, what you're trying to teach them. So it's about taking the time to let yourself come across in a way that it's sort of like opening up your brain a bit, not just talk, talking about what you want to do and where you want to go, but why the why behind it, the motivation behind it. And if you're a leader of an organization, it's especially important to do that. Any thoughts or questions about this dimension, about substance? I'm going to take that as a no. Let's go on to style. This one's already come up. Okay, style is the most obvious. These are the most obvious facets, the most observable. Overt, skill-based patterns of communicating leadership, communicative leadership that build motivation and that shape and sustain performance. Okay, again, that's pretty lofty. Let's break it down. Qualities of contagious energy and vibrant health. Interesting. You want to look healthy. You want to look up to the job. A way of showing up consistently over time that makes people feel comfortable and know what they're getting. Acting in a way that shows an understanding of social protocol appropriate for the situation. So in other words, this is, I guess, Greg, going back to Greg's points about gravitas and walking in the room and demanding, controlling your, what, what did you say? Commanding. There's the verb. Commanding the room. The, these all have to do with style because those are observable characteristics, but they, it also breaks down in a really interesting way that goes beyond what you might traditionally think about style. So let's look at demeanor. Acts like a competent executive, adapts style and appearance appropriate to the situation, handles situations with tact. Okay, at the beginning of the pandemic, clients were coming to us saying, we're working virtually, but that doesn't mean that our workers should be showing up to a meeting 
with clients in a t-shirt. It just doesn't work for our organization. They need to think a little more about how they're coming across. That makes sense. And that is a demeanor, a demeanor issue. Here's how it breaks down for us. Supporting a clear sense of personal brand through appearance and communication. Well-groomed, well-dressed. Showing up looking ready for the game, which Greg's manager didn't do. Being the person others want to work with. Being self-aware, present and engaged always, having appropriate energy, tone and facial expression, being able to command the room. Okay, so this is, this dimension used to be called appearance and base recently changed it because appearance brought up so many issues that, that people didn't like, didn't feel comfortable with. And in some situations, this brings up a lot of arguments about, well, where are you telling me how to dress? Are you telling me that I, that I, if I'm a woman, that I have to wear heels? If I'm a man, that I have to wear a jacket? I mean, those things are part of it, but they're not the primary, not the primary issue. Greg, do you want to talk a little bit about that group you worked with on this in Atlanta? No, just, yeah, they just recently, I was, I was teaching this content to a group of people who are in a senior leadership development program. It was a room of 32 people or so, and I was introducing them to each one of these facets. And there was a woman in this program who pulled me aside at break and she said, I have a real problem with demeanor. I, I said, you know, tell me more. And she says, well, my entire life, I have seen women who look the part, who wear the makeup, do the hair, do the heels, all of that. I have seen them get promoted when I wasn't. And she says, I just have a really hard time swallowing this pill of demeanor and that it's important. And so through conversation, I asked her if it was okay to open this up for the entire room to talk through. So we did. And, you know, there's, there are landmines all over this particular facet of demeanor. So there was a, the school of thought that said, you know what, the world we live in, yeah, we're sorry that that's the way it is, but appearance how people show up does have influence in decision making. But what was interesting is that I asked this, this woman still in private, what would you say of these 15 facets are the ones that shine really strongly for you? I don't remember her complete answer, but authenticity was one of the facets that, that she said. And I remember the conversation going in the direction of, well, you show up authentically without makeup, without being all fixed up. And that has served you very well because maybe you have um, a greater sense of confidence or maybe other people perceive you as being more confident because of your demeanor. So the, the big thing I want you to take away from this particular discussion is that again, we all shine in different ways and we need to be mindful of our own professional brand, make peace with it and know how to lean in and pull back from these facets in order to reach your, your professional brand. Demeanor is not something that was particularly important for this woman. It's fine, that's who she is. She can lean into other facets. Yeah, it's interesting because it, it demands flexibility for everybody, the, okay, I'm a boomer. I need to get used to the fact that people are, I'm gonna be training people with piercings and tattoos and that's okay. And 10 years ago, it wouldn't have been quite so okay, but now it's, I'd get over it. You know, this is, <laughs> these people are those people and you can't, I can't, it's my job to adapt to them. It's, it's, well, it's both, I guess, but it's not, it's not like there are a certain set of rules that must be followed for demeanor. It is a flexible moving target. So interesting. Thanks for talking about that moment, Greg. Okay, let's go on here. Let's go to intentionality. This is a much more of a communication issue than the other. Clarifying direction, keeping actions aligned and on track, all without stifling dissent, or neglecting the need, neglecting needs to adjust course. So you want to come across as someone who knows what he or she is doing and you've got a plan. What does it look like? Framing conversations to ensure relevance to this group at this point in time. Calling meetings to order to signal work is about to begin, which is 
taking responsibility for the meeting that you are facilitating, wrapping up meetings with clear summary and action items, telling pur purposeful stories to help others understand the why behind the interaction or decision in interactive initiative. Wow, I've been misreading that word. Facilitating discussions well. So this is about the process that takes place when you are facilitating a meeting. It's about making sure that you are taking the time to communicate. Going back to Manura said that the, the orderly part of the orderly conversation requires structure, which seems so obvious, but you'd be surprised at how many, how many times that structure gets lost. So intentionality helps people trust you because you put in the work and communicated that work about what you're gonna do in that meeting. And I want to talk about inclusiveness too, because this is another you know, very facilitation skill related facet. Actively involving others, welcoming diverse points of view, encouraging ownership and mission, and empowering the initiative. The so interact inter both of the three eyes here in this in this list all have to do with how well you are managing that group and how you're making people feel as a part of that group making sure the right people are in the room giving everyone an opportunity to speak during discussions making people feel comfortable and part of the group showing curiosity listening well asking good questions delegating tasks without bias toward gender or marginalized individuals the we were talking to a group of but I think mostly women at a, at a workshop recently, and they are high up in their organization. And they said many times they were still the ones asked to take notes during the meeting, not the men. So you gotta be aware of that stuff and not make people feel unwelcome, which is when you talk about DE&I in a meeting, you're talking about making people feel glad to be there and part of the group and comfortable. It's not about, you know, you manage things the way you want to and they have to respond to you. You need to make sure that they're feeling comfortable, easy, not gonna be an emotional experience for them because of the way they're being treated. So I think that the intentionality, don't waste people time, don't waste people's time, have a plan and inclusiveness is make sure that you're using those various perspectives in a way that makes people feel welcome. Any thoughts or questions about this dimension? Okay. Might be worth talking, Dale, about connecting the dots between intentionality and inclusiveness and that notion of proximity bias that mm, was yep. introduced earlier, right? So thinking about how particularly inclusiveness and interactivity show up for you in meetings is one way to help you avoid unintentionally committing proximity bias. So we want to show you, I'm gonna pull back the curtain a little bit on our development with this particular content. Now I mentioned earlier that- hey, Sorry, Greg, um, I meant to ask, I was trying to get off mute very slowly oh, sure. there. Um, I, I wanted to ask about the last uh, dimension around style uh, and how you are showing up and how do you navigate that trying to balance the existing culture of an organization? Because sometimes, as an example, my style can clash with how people in the organization are used to working, right? Maybe. I'm a little bit more laid back. Um, I, I have, you know, a, a looser agenda, right? I don't have like six items and I want to hit all of them. You know, I have times there, like five minutes, seven minutes here. Like I don't run a meeting like that, right? I have three, three items, you know, maybe one objective up top and that's my style, but maybe it doesn't really fit the organization. So how do you navigate that? Dale, do you want to take that or do you want me to? You take it and then I'll comment. I'm, I'm still gathering thoughts. Yeah. You bring up a really interesting point, Mohammed. And so there is a concept that Dale and I work with that is part of an extension of the orderly conversation. And that tells us that people gravitate to one side or the other 
of an orderly conversation. So some people are going to be more comfortable on the orderly side, probably some of the people you work with. Other people are going to be more comfortable on the conversational side. And given what you just said, Mohammed, I'm, I'm guessing that's where you are. And there, we have an assessment that people can take that helps them identify where are they naturally on that continuum. And what does that mean in terms of your communication strengths? And what does that mean for your weaknesses or the perception of weaknesses from other people, right? So there's that. What we would say is you have to be comfortable on both sides of the orderly conversation. Mm -hmm. Now let's set that aside. And let's put that in the context of executive presence and how you're being perceived because Suzanne defines executive presence as one of the elements is how other people perceive you. And what is the effect that you're having on those people because of that? Well, for what, for what you just described, maybe your communication style isn't matching up to the expectations of the organization. So that's on you to figure out, are you okay with that and the perceptions that are attached to that? Or is that important enough for you to fit in that you're going to, to address that style? And that's your decision to make because it's your brand. It has to be authentically you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And I would, that. that's a good I wasn't going to go that way, Greg, so I'm glad that you you did. My question would be, if I were working with you, Mahabha, would be to say, is it working? Is your approach working? Because if it is, that tells us one thing. If if you're finding that people are frustrated with you and not, and not the meetings are not as successful as they could be, then then I would say, what can you do right. that you're comfortable with to adapt? But it's about, and Greg is going to go into this next, because many times, when you need to change a habit, you hate it. You really don't want to change that habit because you like that habit. <laughs> it's your habit. But sometimes you need you need to go outside of that. But Greg, I'm going to give it back to you so that you can dive into that. Yeah, I'm looking at the clock and we have a couple extra minutes. Uh, I'm going to tell another story about something that happened with Dale and me several years ago. We were working with a client. They are a clothing manufacturing company. Their brand is Preppy, I think they would, would yeah. I can't name the, the brand. You would know if I did. Lots of pastel colors, very, very trendy, hot, expensive stuff. And we were working with designers, which is, let me tell you, that is a fun day when you get to sit in a room with a bunch of, of fashion designers. But they were all wearing the clothing that they had designed. Everybody but one. And one of the women what all of my stories are about women today. I don't know why. No, that's not true. I, I told a story about a guy too. Uh, this particular woman was not dressed in the same way that everyone else was. She was entirely in black, lots of tattoos, lots of piercings. And I, I say that not to judge, but she didn't fit in. I don't think anybody in that room would have said that she fits in with the rest of them. And one of the th questions that we always ask people, and we asked it of you, is how do you want to be described? When I'm coaching individually someone, I lead with that question, right? And so people will inevitably say the same things that you said. I was one-on-one -on -one with this woman in a coaching situation. I asked her the question, and she said, I don't care. Okay, so we've got someone who is doesn't fit in with the rest of the group, and she has what I would say is an attitude about, like she just simply doesn't care. At least that's how what she said, how other people perceive her. So the question I'm thinking in the back of my mind is why does she work for this organization? Because clearly she's off brand. Her behaviors were off brand and her demeanor is, is off brand. I would hope, not when I say this, a lot of people get bristly. So I'm gonna just say that first, but I would hope that eventually she would find another job at another organization where she does fit in because that's a lot of energy working with a group of people where you don't fit in and you have the attitude of, I don't care, right? I know she wouldn't have dressed that way if she didn't care how she was being perceived. So I didn't do this, but I would have encouraged her if I, that was my job, find it, her own tribe, find her own organization where she did fit in. We'll see. And it was more than just the clothing. It was. You're on mute, Dale, all of a sudden. How about now? Yeah, there we can hear you. Okay, sorry. It's, 
the little mic thing has gotten really sensitive on my headset. It was more than just what that woman wore. She had, she also walked out in meetings if she didn't think they were appropriate, which I know we all want to do. You know, if she's getting bored of the meeting, out the door she goes. So I think it was interesting. She was, I'd never seen anybody with that much chutzpah, I guess, I don't know. She was. All right. I said we were going to pull the court curtain back a little bit, and we are there at this moment. So I mentioned earlier that several members of our uh, senior team here at Turbine Communication became certified to teach the Bates material. As part of that certification, we had to experience a 360 assessment, and the results became part of our training. The 360 is available to you as well. I, I, I don't mean to do a commercial, but I just want you to get a sense of why the 360 is in this program. So if you've not, if you're not familiar with a 360, it's an assessment that it, you ask other people to take about you. It's the people who report to you, your peers and people you have reported to over the years. So what I'm going to do is show you the my results. It's called my constellation. There will be three uh, facets that are circled that I scored high in and three of my, my lowest scores. So this is what it looked like. I scored high on authenticity, integrity, and demeanor. Now, given my role at Turpin Communication, given what I do, I felt very good about those as being strengths of mine. I wanna focus on my developmental opportunities. And notice I'm not using the term weakness. They're developmental opportunities that I can learn to improve. So I scored low on restraint, composure, and assertiveness. Restraint and composure might seem kind of the same. They are sort of. Restraint is about avoiding knee-jerk reactions in everyday interactions, whereas composure is more about how are you coming across in moments of crisis? Are, can you be steady at the wheel when the world seems to be falling apart? So I clearly was not a very pleasant person to be around sometimes in meetings, but my coach helped me understand that I'm a very fast thinker, a fast decision maker, and I'm ready to move on, whereas other people have to think things through a little more carefully or in, in more detail than I do. So in meetings, then I was coming across as impatient. So my intentions as a leader were not matching other people's perceptions of me. So the question then is, how can I flex my style to improve relationships and business outcomes? And my coach said, it's super easy. Work on being more patient and letting other people have their say. So I can do that. In the moment, I can recognize when I'm starting to get prickly and I want to move on, but recognize that other people need a little bit more time. That is one way to make this less uh, overwhelming, trying to, trying to stretch out you know, the, the new skills for yourself. I want to talk now about assertiveness as an overstrength. I, I said to my coach, I don't understand why assertiveness is scored low for me because I'm one of the more assertive people I know. And he said, ha, that's the problem. This is an overstrength for you. So if we glue my impatience and my assertiveness, you can see that I was a real treat to work with sometimes when, when I got myself worked up. So I can now understand that I just need to pull back and let other people have more of a say. However, and this goes to something that somebody, uh, the, the chat has moved on, I, I, my eyes aren't landing on it, but someone said something about being situational around uh, authenticity, absolutely. So how much you choose to flex can be different based on your role and what you're trying to achieve. And my, my coach asked me, you know, how is Turpin doing right now? And by the way, this was years ago, this was well before the pandemic hit. I said, you know, we're on a trajectory to have the best year ever and things are really, really good. And he said, great, you don't need to exercise any more assertiveness because things are working just fine. But let's think about what happened on Friday the 13th, March 2020. That was the day the world fell apart for Turpin. We were looking at a future that we couldn't, we couldn't figure out. Our clients never wanted us to do virtual stuff, although we'd been working virtually for years at that point. That's not what our clients knew us for. So our entire business collapsed. I was able to, during that time, as scared as I was, lean into my assertiveness and vision a little bit and rally the troops on Turpin Communications team 
and figure out a plan for what's next. And we actually completely pivoted this business to be 100% virtual, including all of our marketing in the span of about 10 days. So again, it's situational. How knowing what is the situation I'm in and how am I going to lean into uh, a particular facet? Now, I want to just say, I'm not taking credit for single-handedly keeping the business on, on the rails, right? It was, a, it was a group effort, but I was able to lead that effort. All right, Dale, I'm going to let you share your constellation, and then we'll compare the two. Okay, here's mine. So Greg and I share some of the green ones. Demeanor, integrity, concerns, those are the ones that came across high. My low points were confidence, vision, and assertiveness. And I have to say, assertiveness is not an overstrength for me. It is a result of, I believe, being too analytical, which means, and an introvert. An analytical introvert sitting in a meeting is not going to jump in and start talking about what he thinks quickly. It's just not going to happen. And we did another test, which was something called Geniuses. And it was, oh God, what's the guy's name that wrote that book, Greg? It's the, it's the- Patrick Lencioni. Thank you, Lencioni, the, the team guy. The, anyway, in that one, I'm, one of my geniuses is discernment. So, ba so basically, if Greg is the accelerator, I am the brakes. I'm like, my attitude is, we got to think about this more. I don't think it's going to work. Let's, let's take more time. So you can imagine how that's going to make me come across in terms of confidence and vision. It's my lack of assertiveness, my lack of quick response or even average response in some situations made it seem to others that I did not have much confidence or much vision. And I have both. It just it defined by them, it did not come across that I did. And that's an important thing to learn. So I needed to speak up more. My coach said, just speak up more. And that's the nice thing about Bates. It always comes down to, you know, one or two things. Just, just do this. It's, it's going to be fine. Just make sure that you are speaking up a little sooner than you're comfortable and you will be able to, to solve this, this lack that people sense in you in terms of your executive presence. So that's it, Greg, back to you. Yeah. So if we were to lay my results and Dale's results over each other. Now we make up the leadership, the, the senior leadership team here at Turpin Communication. We don't have any strengths in the middle dimension of substance. Given what we do, given that we are communication consultants, I mean, we're business owners as a result of that. We didn't go into this thinking we wanted to own a business, but it explains why we sometimes struggle through making business decisions and why we tend to rely on our own set of consultants um, to, to help us through particularly challenging times. So this tool can be used many ways, not only as you know, growing your own self-awareness, but also growing the self-awareness and the team dynamics of, of you know, how everyone works together. All right. I mentioned earlier that we have this handout and I wanna show you that each one of the facets has a page dedicated to it. There is the, uh, the definition and then what it's not, what an overstrength looks like, and most importantly, toward the middle there is what does it look like in meetings? Now, Dale has been talking about storytelling quite often around, it is one of the tools you have to lean into a variety of the facets, depending on what you're trying to accomplish. We also weave in emotional intelligence and crisis communication. So we hope that you will print that thing out and read it through and figure out, at least for yourself, how you think people are perceiving you. Now, we are uh, we're doing a test right now. Let's, let's I think the easiest way to say it. We're, we've developed a workshop, a public enrollment workshop called Executive Presence Essentials, Skills to Build Your Leadership Communication. Now, Turpin Communication is a B2B company. We sell to corporations, but there's been so much interest on the individual level around growing, growing people's self-awareness around their executive presence that we are testing the waters on offering a workshop. Um, it's an interactive workshop. I'll talk a little bit more about the details of it. And Kevin will give you a link where you can express interest in this thing. But I wanted to plant that seed at this moment here. And that gets us to our last agenda item for the last 15 minutes or so, 
we're going to talk through some leadership communication tools and techniques. Now, this is a picture of a frame. This is the framing strategy. It's one of the, the most downloaded tools that we have on our website. So every meeting, presentation, training session has three pieces, an introduction, a body, and a conclusion. And you may have heard the tell them strategy at some point in your career. Tell them what you're going to tell them. Tell them to tell them what you told them. However, that does not work for business meetings because in a business meeting, you're doing more than telling. You're listening, you're facilitating, you're connecting dots. So we need something better than a tell them strategy. So let's imagine that a meeting is starting. There is this chit chat that happens. And remember, um, the relationship management is super, super important. And you want that chit chat to happen. That's when you learn about people's home lives and what sports they're interested, if any, and you know what happened over the weekend and all of that. But at some point, the meeting needs to be called to order. So you need to formalize the conversation in the introduction. And the introduction is where you should be providing direction, purpose, context, and giving people a reason to participate. In other words, you're answering the questions, what are we talking about and why? So that's what we want to get at. Every meeting, every presentation gets started off on the right foot. So we have a tool to help you do that. It's called the framing strategy. We're going to give you a worksheet for that as well. Let's imagine that we are in just a very simple staff meeting. And you can see here that we have four sticky notes, current situation, today's goal, the agenda, and the benefits. So let me give you an example of how this might work. Again, this is a staff meeting. Hey, everybody, thanks for joining the staff meeting. I want to recognize that there's a lot going on, but we still do need to have the weekly staff meeting because we need to get everybody on the same page. So the agenda will look like this. I'm going to do the round robin update, and I will call on each of you. And then I need to roll out the yet another hybrid work policy. Why are we doing this? As you know, we need to keep the momentum going. So there, I've been able to answer the questions. What are we talking about and why? I want to give you another example. Let's say that we all work in the C-suite. So all 23 of us just got a promotion, but I'm the CEO, and this is my strategic meeting to run. And let's assume that we are in the middle of crisis. Things are falling apart around us. I might frame up this meeting by saying, hey, everybody, first of all, I want to recognize that there are a lot of unknowns and fears. On top of that, we've got market instability. So our goal today, I wanted to bring us all together to create our what's next plan. We're going to take a look at financials, then some emerging market trends that might be okay for us. And we're going to do a SWOT analysis, and then we'll work on a communication plan. The reason we're doing this is because two things, we need to stabilize the business, and we need to reassure our employees, customers, and investors that we've got this. So again, I was able to answer the questions, what are we talking about and why? Now, let's assume that uh, Megan, my eyes just landed on your video. Uh, so let's say, Megan, that you and I work uh, at the same organization, we're peers, and we work with a guy named Tom who has sent a hair on fire email to a whole bunch of people. You and I are freaked out about this. In fact, I pick up the phone. Remember those things, those old fashioned telephones? So I pick up the phone, Megan, and I, I, I say, hey, you have a minute. This is about that emotional email from Tom. I was hoping we could work together to figure out how we might help him calm down. So if you've got a minute, you and I can talk through some ideas and craft a response to his email. And the reason I think we need to do this is to avoid a fire with his team and restore confidence. So Megan, no matter what was going on in your brain, i have able to help you get focused on what I want to talk about here. So I, I bring this up because this framing strategy can be used in a variety of situations that you find yourself in. So thanks, Megan, for playing along. Now, if we were in a workshop, like I described earlier, we would give you an opportunity to frame up one of your upcoming meetings or presentations, and we'd watch your video back. That would be captured. We'd watch that video back, and there would be one-on-one -on -one coaching. So that's the difference, one of many, between a webinar like this and a full-blown interactive workshop like I was talking about. Now, this is the image of that framing strategy worksheet. Again, we're going to make sure that you get your hands on this at the end of the webinar. We had introduced you to the concept of orderly conversations. Now, orderly conversations require engagement. 
So what exactly do we mean by being engaged? Well, it's your ability to think on your feet. You're in the moment and able to think on your feet. You're self-aware and in control. You connect with individuals. You read the room. You talk with people, not at, and you feel comfortable. In other words, you're not nervous. You know what it feels like to be engaged because you're like you're engaged in everyday conversation. But when the stakes are high and when we're working virtually, it becomes way more difficult to do. So in face to face situations, there are two skills that we would say are primary to engagement, pausing and breathing to think. You take a moment, you formulate a thought, the words fall out of your mouth. You don't even think about that pause, but you do pause. You also connect with people with eye contact. You observe them. You notice that someone has something to say and you made you make space for them to be able to do that. So in face-to-face -face engagement, we can focus on how it feels. We know when a conversation is going well because we're engaged. It feels good. In virtual engagement, though, we lose eye contact, as you very well know. So we need to focus on how you're being perceived, not how it feels. So Again, we go back to that notion of how are we being perceived? So best practices for engaging the camera. Look into the camera when you're speaking and when you're listening and when you're listening, be sure to nod. It's not enough to actually hear people. You want to give people the indication that you're listening. A nod and a smile is the way to do that. You do want to check in to observe others' videos from time to time. Now I've got your videos over here. So when you see me look over here, I'm checking in to make sure that you're all with me. Now, the metaphor I like to use is when I'm speaking into the camera, it's like I'm driving a car. I'm looking through my windshield, but every once in a while, I need to check my mirrors and make sure that we're in good shape. Most of the time is spent looking into the camera, and it is a learned skill. It does not come naturally. And because we are leaders or aspiring leaders, we want to be a role model for other people. So we need to use the camera well, so hopefully they will as well. Now, in terms of enthusiasm, it's about working as hard as you do face-to-face. -face. Being engaging is vo vocal energy, facial expression, posture, gestures, all those things should be just as they are in face-to-face. -face. Now, I use the term engaged and engaging. They're actually two different things. Being engaged, as I've already said, is about being in the moment and able to think on your feet. Being engaging is about being compelling enough so that people want to listen to you. Both of those things are important. They're two, two sides of the same coin. Now, we need to talk about the technical stuff too. Camera placement is really, really important. So there are two adjustments you want to make. Get your camera at eye level. What most people are looking down so that the camera looks up their nose. Nobody looks good like that. So get your camera at eye level. And then adjust the angle so that your eyes are in the upper third. You can see in this image right here, that white line at the top is going right through his eyes. If you've ever taken a uh, photography class, you know the beauty and the, uh, the wonder that is the rule of thirds. So we asked you early how you would like to be described by the people you work with and for, and you started to identify your professional brand. And it's my hope that we've been able to give you some ideas, some insights into how you can be purposeful or intentional about how you build and maintain your professional brand of executive presence. And Dale showed us this graphic a little bit earlier. This is the skill development process. You start with awareness of the thing, then you assess how you're doing, and ultimately you develop those skills. It's, I think Dale said earlier, it's not this linear thing. You're always going back and forth. So today we were focused primarily on awareness and you might have started to assess how you come across. I'm hoping we've been able to give you some insights into for you what's needed and why. We've been mentioning all of these books, blogs, and tools that Kevin is going to drop in. We've got all the leader you can be, the orderly conversation, EQ applied, and then of course the executive presence handout along with the framing strategy. So lots of stuff being dropped into chat right now. Feel free to download what you think is most appropriate for what you want. All of these things will also be included in the email that we send out a little bit later. And that brings me to my final thank you and the final best practice, which is try to end your meetings a little bit early because you probably have to run to the bathroom and the refrigerator. And for, you know, so many of us are just racking up meeting after meeting after meeting. 
try to end early.